Hi Molly, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by you. I think you seem to have had a, a very full, rich life. Um, David Parker comes walking past and stops and goes, oh hi Molly, and talks to you for five minutes. So you're obviously connected. <laughs> I go on Scoop and I find there's about 20 articles on Scoop that have been written by you. Um, you're still racing a yacht, your own yacht. I mean, so I was wondering if we could hear a bit more about your life. It's quite easy. Uh, so basically I became worried about climate change in 1962 when I went for my PhD in La Jolla, California, which I never finished. I got a consolation master's degree in physical chemistry. But we talked around the uh, lunch tables on the green with the climate scientists who were doing the measurements in Mauna Loa. So we were talking at lunch about climate change in 62, and I've been worried about it ever since. And my specialty was physical chemistry, uh, and basically thermal, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. So I know, you know, about how energy works and energy and entropy works throughout the planet. I also did a course in bioecology in 1956 with some of the very earliest of the scientific ecologists. So they moved beyond being naturalists and did the science and the mapping and you know the precision. And I studied bioecology in one year in 56. So those are my two interests. Uh, climate change as, as the thermodynamics of water and carbon exchange within the planet. How that works. And bioecology, and it turns out they relate very closely. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so, how did you end up coming to New Zealand? To <laughs> that was a case of married and come to New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. So, my husband was a postdoctoral fellow in the same lab that I worked as a first year graduate student. And he saw me occasionally hanging by the door jam by my fingers and chinning myself up just to keep my strength up for rock climbing. He was a tramper. He was a Kiwi and he was skint. He couldn't afford a car, he couldn't afford a phone, but he was a postdoctoral fellow. And when I decided that the area that I wanted to study was not being run at UCLA where Hugh and I were, mm -hmm but at La Jolla. I moved to La Jolla and Hugh took the trouble to come down from time to time. <laughs> and within a year it was married and come to New Zealand. Wow, yeah. So he was a uh, chemical physicist speciali specializing in the interaction of light and matter. Mm -hmm. And he was doing some of the most difficult jobs, which is basically counting photons mm -hmm. that came out of uh, chemically that came out of chemical reactions. Yeah. So that was his business. Mm. But he ended up uh, he was never very well paid, mm. and he ended up going to the Institute for Nuclear Sciences which paid him to go overseas. And uh, his specialty, he did some of this photochemistry, mm. but in the end they desperately needed somebody to do the radiocarbon dating. Yeah. Hugh was a very precise and careful chemist, and he could get radiocarbon numbers yeah. out of tiny samples and he ended up his last working years were uh, doing radioactive carbon yeah. dating. Both of all the air samples, he dated all the, or he studied all the, uh, measured the air samples that came from Bering Head, okay. 
put put New Zealand on the world map in doing uh, radiocarbon uh, carbon 14 analysis. But basically, Hugh was a I was a frugalist. I never spent much money. In the end, I bought a car. It was a Volkswagen, and we used it for a decade or two in, in New Zealand, left-hand drive car. Uh -huh. But Hugh was a super frugalist. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we have lived on one income our whole lives. So we were absolutely in tune philosophically and even in the way we ran households yeah. and the way we brought up kids. Yeah. Um, you have children? Have a uh, son and daughter, both of whom are in their 50s now. Yeah. No grandchildren. Uh, yeah. They had other things to do. Yes. But my son lives in Boston or out of Boston. Yeah. He got his uh, a chemistry degree at MIT very keen to work with Donna and Donella Meadows, the Limits to Growth people, because he was transfixed by the feeling of Limits to Growth. But he's also very severely ADHD, and he ended up making mistakes, so he lost his job there, oh, yeah. okay. which is very sad. Yeah. My daughter lives out of Nelson, up, uh, in fact, five kilometers as the Kea flies, or as the Kaka flies, mm -hmm. from Nelson Lakes National Park, okay. about 10, maybe 15 kilometers by road. And they live in a uh, cutover beach forest, abandoned 30, 35 years ago. Okay. And we are now studying forestry ecology, studying the growth rates and the species counts on a dozen plots which we set up randomly yeah. uh, to study how beech forest grows back after it's been cut over. Mm. Interesting. Still doing ecology. Yes. So I'm not sure if you came out to New Zealand and Hugh followed you. Yeah. Um, often it's the other way around. The man goes somewhere and the woman follows, so that's interesting. But I'm not I'm not sure I'm clear yet about what brought you to New Zealand, because you were born in the States. I was born in the States, yeah. and that's where I did my ecology uh, course yeah. and uh, my physics, physical chemistry degree. Yeah. But we married, because his visa ran out, yeah. we married and came to New Zealand, so that's what brought me here. Oh, Hugh... Hugh, Hugh well, is a New Zealander. Is a New Zealander, right. Hugh had the first chemistry PhD at Victoria University. Okay. Mm. And he was a postdoctoral fellow yeah. at UCLA. Yeah. Okay, I, um, I get it now. Um, and you mentioned rock climbing, and, I, I, and I've, um, I've watched, I can't remember the names of the documentaries, but you know, rock climbing in the early 60s, I think it would have been when you were training for rock climbing. Yeah. That would have been the very, early, very, very early days of rock no, climbing. No, no, no. Rock no. climbing has been... My father was a mountaineer and yeah. one, is one of the early Swiss Alpine mm -hmm. Club members in the 1920s, mm -hmm. probably, mm -hmm. and even earlier. Uh, he was a teenager in uh, high school in Switzerland yeah. and went to France, Grenoble, and did all of his climbing in the French Swiss Alps. Okay. So he taught me rock climbing at a place called Quincy Quarry. And of the three of us children, I was the only one who loved it. Mm -hmm. And he'd always said, well, of the three of us, I'm the athletic one, which is actually true. Nice. Um, I'm also aware that you're a Quaker and that you were brought up as a Quaker and I've also, I'm also a Quaker. Yeah. Um, I went to, to Quakers in Christchurch as a refugee from the church I was brought up in, but you were a born Quaker. I'm just you know, curious to hear a little bit more about that and whether you've been involved with Quakers here in New Zealand as well. I only know one or two Quakers who, and my closest colleague in the electricity 
the earliest days of the uh, sustainable electricity movement. My colleague was Bill Moxon, who was human resources officer at the electricity department just down the road, which is now Vic University. Okay. He was a Quaker. Yes. And Bill and I just, I haven't, I haven't even been to a Quaker meeting here. Right. Yeah. So, but Bill was, and I talked in a Quakerish way. Yes. Yeah. And I have talked, always listening as I talk. Yes. And I need spiritual space. Mm -hmm. So, like the Quakers, I go long periods without fussing, yeah. without talking. Yeah. So, I'm spiritually a Quaker, but not practicing. Okay. My mother was a Quaker, yes. and my father's second wife was a Quaker. Okay. My father was a very top flight, well-known in the industry, so to speak, mathematician. Okay, yes invented whole swags of fields of topology. Sorry, he... what was topology? He invent, uh, it started as a topology and it turned into something which I can't remember what it's called. Mm. But topology is kind of the science of knots. Ah. So I've always been kind of interested in knots. <laughs> yes, I'm envious of your school with knots. <laughs> And that brings us to sailing. Tell us about when you first developed an interest in sailing. I wanted to sail all my life. Mm. Uh, I went to summer camp and they were long summer camp, sort of uh, six or seven weeks summer mm. camps in Maine, mm. uh, in the forest, in the regenerating forest in Maine. And they had a, a foldable canoe, and you could sometime put a sail on it. Mm -hmm. And I guess I sailed that canoe once and thought, this is me. Mm -hmm. I was very much a water person, so I did a lot of swimming, mm -hmm. and I can still swim very effectively. Yeah. Uh, but I always wanted to sail, but we uh, lived near Boston, and my mother was never had enough income from the divorce to do anything expensive with us. Mm. I mean, I learned my frugality by going out in the woods and being happy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I got a lot of my, you know, the way I work, yeah. go out in the woods and be happy. Yeah. Couldn't afford to sail. Yeah. Uh, so the two kids grew up. Uh, my daughter had horses, couldn't afford that, but did anyway. Mm -hmm. And then they moved out. And suddenly we found that we were uh, not spending so much on the kids. And we started uh, putting a nest egg down. We put a very decent nest egg down. Mm -hmm. And then I got a very badly slipped disc, uh. pushing my push bike up the hill which is almost one in five right. with a heavy load so uh, badly slipped a disc took three years to repair it after no more than ten appointments with a magnificent physiotherapist and I did her exercises from then on mm -hmm. and finally I found I could sit down three years later and do all sorts of other things. And I thought, there's no reason that I shouldn't get a boat. Mm -hmm. So my neighbor had a P-class boat mm -hmm. and uh, I took it out in our bay, mm -hmm. but I could, uh, it was a windy summer and I could only go within the bay where it wasn't too windy. And once I got too far out of the bay and tipped it over, couldn't get it back. But my neighbor hopped in his little dinghy, which lived on the beachfront, and uh, was about to tow him. Oh, yeah, he did tow me in. Mm. But, uh, and he said, Molly, buy a Starling and join the Muir Thai Yacht Club, mm. which I did. So for about five years, I sailed the Starling at the Yacht Club. I always wanted to go. Once a year, the yacht club would do a harbor cruise, 
and we took those little nine foot boats and we would go uh, from Eastbourne around the boats at York Bay where I live around Sounds Island all the way across the harbor to uh, what we call the White Lady yeah. which is the thing off Point Jerningham mm -hmm. and back to Eastbourne mm. wow. and I said I want to tour and asked you yes you can buy a boat <laughs> and we bought a 26 foot Allen Wright tracker mm -hmm. and Hugh and I used to cross to the sound so we probably did a dozen crossings in Uncle Sam mm -hmm. yes it was named Uncle Sam when I bought her <laughs> <laughs> and then I really wanted to do more go beyond just although we took a month once and we went all the way around Polaris and all the way down to Havelock and back but and yeah once or twice we actually crossed to Nelson and went to the Tasman National Park mm. but I wanted a bigger boat which uh, was much easier to cruise and much quicker to do the crossing mm -hmm. so I bought our 30 foot ocean capable boat with a tall rig an extra meter higher than usual on the mast mm -hmm. a Chico 30 which is famously uh, ocean friendly mm -hmm. quite a small cockpit because it was designed for single-handing racing mm -hmm. to the islands mm -hmm. and I still have Shikadi mm -hmm. and I sail it mostly with an all-woman's crew mm -hmm. and we have a ball <laughs> fantastic 81 and still racing a Keeler competitive yacht. on the start line yeah, competitive on the start line as well yeah. <laughs> we know the rules yes yes yeah fantastic <laughs>